Hello listeners, Kathy Lawless, Life Story Curator. I'm all about capturing and curating career and life stories as a meaningful way to celebrate a milestone moment like a big old birthday, anniversary, retirement, or graduation. And I'm at my best when curating photo books that move your memories from the basement or your phone or your computer to the coffee table, giving you and your family and friends access to these treasured memories for years to come. I also love curating and capturing life and career stories through this podcast series, How Did I Get Here? It's a series of interviews designed for people just starting out in their careers, people in transition or possibly feeling stuck, and giving them access to the stories of people who have been there, done that, so that they might be inspired with some new ideas or maybe just comforted knowing they are not alone, that everybody starts somewhere and everybody goes through times of transition and times when they feel stuck. Today, I'm very excited to be interviewing Claudia Miller, who is a career coach and workplace expert. Welcome, Claudia. Hi, Kathy. I am so excited to be here and especially for some of the stuff that we're going to be talking about today. Yeah, how fun is this? So Claudia and I met through... Well, I guess we met online and then got to know each other. And she's got a really cool story uh, about turning, you know, challenges in her life into then her expertise and into a new career. So, but I'm get, getting ahead of myself. Before we so. jump into today's interview, let's hear a word from our sponsor, Life Story Curator, a testimonial from one of their very happy clients. Oh my gosh. If you're considering hiring Kathy Lawless to do a book for you, you need to do it. My name is Ann DuPont and I'm Chair Emeritus of a nonprofit that's been based in Denver called The Leadership Investment. And after 20 plus years of being in business, we decided we had to celebrate and commemorate all of the great work we'd done and the impact we'd had in the Denver community. So we hired Kathy Lawless and Life Story Curator to help us do exactly that. And I've got to tell you, the result was, has been simply outstanding. And we went into it with a little bit of fear, thinking, is this going to be too much work? Can we really take this on? And Kathy just made it absolutely painless. She was fun. She was creative. She broke the work into bite-sized pieces that we could really take hold of and get done. And she just made it a lot of fun. We had a lot of laughter along the way. And the feedback from the members of our organization, from the staff, the community, the volunteers, has simply been outstanding. It has really done quite a remarkable job of capturing the essence of everything we achieved over 20 years. So if you're thinking about doing something like this for your organization, for your career, for your family, I would highly recommend it and I would absolutely say that Kathy Lawless and Life Story Curator is the person for you. Let's start with the icebreaker questions, Claudia, so that we get to know you. So uh, mm -hmm. tell us where you grew up, you know, what part of the country or what part of the world, and uh, what your family dynamic was like, you know, how many siblings, where you are in the birth order, and how both of those things, you know, where you grew up and the people you grew up with and all that uh, affected you and, and shaped you. Yeah, so I was born in Guatemala. And for some of you, you're like, where the hell is Guatemala? <laughs> it's in Central America. So around like Mexico and Salvador and Honduras are our neighbors. So I was born in Guatemala. My family came to the US to go on a trip and visit my great uncle in like East Chicago, Indiana. And unfortunately, I um, came down with like, I, I have this rare blood illness that literally people don't know where it comes from and there's no cure. So that made us kind of stay in the U.S. And, you know, we kind of had to go through all like the paperwork aspect of it. My, my mom gave up her salon. My dad gave up like his job and everything. And I ended up growing up in Chicago. So most have been always been really a city girl. Now I live in the suburbs. So now that I'm married, but um, that's why I've grown up. I've grown up here in Chicago, which uh, for some of you might be thinking like, why are you living in Chicago when it's so cold? And I asked my mom the same thing. Like, why do we end up in Chicago and not someplace warmer? But that's where I've been most of my life. Um, it's really everything that I can remember, actually. And I would say I'm the oldest out of like the household I grew up in. So I have three younger sisters, but I do have two older half sisters who are my dad's first marriage. And I have two younger brothers and a half um, and a half sister from my dad's third marriage. So it's kind of like this 
big different um, family dynamic, but um, usually my immediate family is just myself and my three sisters and my mom. Uh, so definitely the older sibling complex. Uh, for sure. that's, that's where I was going. <laughs> Do you still have that older sibling? Even though this all this blended family dynamic is there, it really kind of starts with uh, you were still the oldest kind of in your nu- little nucleus in the beginning. And yes. Well, my mom worked a lot. So I, you know, I was the one, you know, helping my, my sisters with their homework, taking them to school, picking them up from school, giving them dinner, taking care of them. So I really learned very early on of what it, you know, what it takes to take care of somebody else um, besides yourself. Wow. So what's the age difference between your, you and your sisters? So I have a 20, so I'm 33. Um, there's a 28, then there's a 25 and then there's an 18 year old. Oh, wow. Okay. So there's kind of a, you're kind of tight and then there's a big gap. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. So I think when I was 16, my, my little sister was born and, you know, a lot of people thought that she was my daughter and I'm like, no, it's just my, my little sister. <laughs> there's just a big age gap here. <laughs> well, and, and you look beautiful. You look fabulous. What happened with yeah. the blood issue? I mean, did, you know, they, they've now figured it out or is it just yeah. manageable or? It, um, they can manage it. So for example, uh, I was hospitalized in and out, you know, throughout, you know, when I was four, it started when I was diagnosed when I was four years old in and out throughout school. And finally I had a surgery at 17. They did tell me, you know, Hey, we, there's no way to cure it. And there's no exactly, like there's no cure, but we can, if we remove your spleen, there might be a chance that, you know, it might just manage it or because I, I guess the spleen was eating my white blood count and my white blood cells don't really know the clinical terms around it but you know they gave me like you have a 30 40 percent chance of living and two we don't know if it's going to work and at that point even in high school I was in and out of the hospital every other week and I even had to my friends will bring in my homework at the hospital so I can finish it because I was still you know wanted to get straight A's and it was just really hard, especially being a teenager in and out of, like, I could not do any sports. And I know usually for your icebreakers, you like to say like, what sports do you do? <laughs> I was not allowed to do sports. I was even told to be careful going up and down the stairs because if I fall, I can get an internal hemorrhage and die instantly. So it was a lot of things around it. So I had to be very careful. And at that point, I just, I told my mom, I rather have surgery and potentially, you know, be able to have somewhat manageable and have an actual life than being out of the hospital. I rather, you know, take that risk. And thankfully, you know, knock on wood, I've been good since then. It's been manageable. I just kind of have to stay cognizant. There's some things like, like I can't take aspirin. Um, I have to watch out for some, like if I get like red spots around my ankles or there's like little uh, triggers that I can still say like, oh, if I see these signs, that means I need to rush into the hospital or I need to get my blood checked. So it's, like I said, it's just been fine up until this point, but they told me it can either come back tomorrow, it can come back in five years or never come back. And since it's so rare, there's not much research around it either. Yeah. Wow. What a, um, talk about living with uncertainty. Um, But I guess, you know, life is uncertain for everybody, right? But it's just, wow, right there in front of you, right? The whole, oh, don't get hurt. Don't fall. Don't, you know, you're like, wait a minute, how can I be a kid? If, uh, if I'm so restricted, right? Wow. Yeah. And your sister, none of your sisters had this, your biological sister. No, so just no to- I actually don't even know anyone that has, this. Yeah. like I said, it's really rare and like, there's no reason. No one in my, my, my sisters are healthy and they, you know, do sports and they can do all these things. It was just, I was the lucky one. Yeah. <laughs> oh, well, and, um, so, uh, and, and what about like eating healthy and getting enough rest Does you know, does that help you stay, you know, so do you, do you really pay more attention yeah. to that, I guess, which may, may mean, you know, you don't overwork, you don't overdo it, that kind of thing, right? Yes. Um, you know, that before I had the surgery, it like my illness kind of just disappeared for a while. There was nothing happening. And in high school, that's when I started, you know, I have to get into college. So I had, you know, mm-hmm. I took a lot of classes. I took AP classes. I was in National Honor Society. I was in a dance club, bilingual club, French club. I mean, I had to figure out other ways of filling up my extracurricular activity since I couldn't do sports mm-hmm. and I wanted to get into college. So I did tend to get overworked a lot. I mean, I would stay up to like one, two in the morning doing homework and waking up at six, trying to get to my first class at seven something. And I needed to get my sisters ready and drop them off at school. 
So they, I came to a point where I was overworked and burned out. And I'm, you know, probably like 15 years old at this point. And that's when I started seeing the symptoms again. And I ended up hospitalized. And since then, it's once it starts happening, I end up going to the hospital like every other week. So now learning from that, I, you know, I still tend to be that overachiever, like type A personality. I need to do everything, but I have gotten better at it of controlling it or saying, is this going to be, is this, this meet my objective of where I'm currently at and what I'm trying to achieve? And if not, is it worth like, is it worth it? Um, and you know, I really have to stay a little bit contained. Now, that doesn't mean I don't stay up sometimes late to do work. I do, but it's not an everyday thing, and it's not something I expect out of myself every single, every single time. Yeah, you have to. You really have to take care of yourself, and because what you don't want is for a physical trigger to let you know you've been overdoing it, right? Because that's probably too far. You've gone too far. Exactly. Away, right? When the, oh, well, I'm so glad that you have learned how to manage this and that we get to hear more about you today. So, okay, well, we're going to shift gears just a little bit. Um, introvert or extrovert or ambivert? I consider myself an extrovert, but then I realize I'm an ambivert. <laughs> like I can go into a party and if I'm feeling like it, I, I can talk to anybody, make friends. And sometimes like, I don't want to talk to anyone. I just want, I don't want to even want to be at this party. I just want to go home and watch TV and cuddle with my puppy and be with my husband. So it really depends. So I, I would say ambivert. Ambervert. Okay. So you, you need both sides of that. So you need people when you want them. And then there's times to say, nope, nope, I yep. need to recharge. Okay. Uh, on the fun meter on a scale of one to five, one being couch potato and five being the life of the party, where do you put yourself? I would say life of the party. Ah, now so I, I get to choose. <laughs> yeah so now I choose like if I know I don't want to go or like before it's like oh a friend friend at this point you know I've gotten older especially now with COVID I it's you can easily say like hey I'm at I can't make it today or I have things going on so I just choose not to if I don't feel like it it's going to be something I really enjoy so but when I do go I'm definitely the life of the party and I like to have fun and I, you know, even if I meet somebody new, I try to include them so that way they feel included in the party and not just like an outcast. Um, so I try to do a really good of that since sometimes when I'm not feeling like it, I tend to be an ambivert and just kind of stay in the, in the shadows. And when somebody brings me like hey, a life of the party person brings me into like their social settings or conversations, then I feel like sometimes I can start coming out um, again as that life of the party person. Yeah. It's great when, when someone does bring you in, I, I was just at a networking event last night and, you know, we're all kind of in this group, uh, different groups huddled up. Right. And then a new guy walks in and you could tell right away, he wasn't comfortable. And so we're like, Hey, come right. You know, and we're like, come on in. And, he, and, and as soon as you welcome someone in like that, they immediately, I mean, he just walked in the door, but you know, it could have been, he could have milled about for a bit and felt, you know, awkward for way too long. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, it's great when someone brings you in and uh, I tend to always want to do that same thing. Make, make other people feel comfortable because I know how awkward it can feel. Exactly. Um, yeah, I know sometimes I get awkward. So I, I appreciate when people do the same and I try to do the same for others. Yeah, awesome. Okay, on the risk meter, same scale, one to five, one being low risk taker, five being high risk taker, where do you put yourself? A high risk taker for sure. For sure. Well, I'm guessing that's more professionally, not physically, because you just can't do things physically. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, like even I and like high risk, like even with like stocks and everything. Like, well, I'm still, you know, I'm, I anticipate or plan that I, you know, I'm going to make it to the 60s and 70s or maybe older, so like mm -hmm. I can get risky with that. Um, you know, there's I I do I am like scared of heights, so I'm not going to like go bungee jumping like. I, I just won't do that, <laughs> but I did go parasailing. So oh, okay. there's like a good in between, but yeah, I feel like overall, I, I tend to take risk um, more than be on the conservative side. Ah, okay. Well, I love these questions because then as we hear your story, we get to hear how all this plays out and it's, you know, it's how you are as yeah. a person, right? That helps influence all these decisions. So, okay, Claudia, well, tell us then what it's like to be a career coach and workplace expert, and then we'll get into how did I get here? Yeah. <laughs> well, it's, you know, it, it's really been a learning experience, even, you know, with COVID, you know, I always feel that there's always going to be learning. I don't care how long you've been in the industry. There's always something to learn. And definitely with COVID and everything happening, the landscape has really changed in the past few months. 
So it's, I'm very excited, you know, to be a career coach and to be able to help, you know, other professionals that are maybe struggling to get a job or feel that, you know, they can never move to the next step in their careers or they feel pigeonholed and stuck where they're at. It's nice to know that I'm able to help them as long as they're coachable. And, you know, because of it, at times I'm even able to change livelihoods where, you know, I've worked with, you know, single moms and, you know, they just left a bad relationship. They, they used to depend on their spouse for, you know, financial support, but working with me now they're able to get 30, 50, 80 K salary increases. And now they have like all of a sudden this, um, confidence, empowerment, hope, and just, you know, livelihood overall that they are so excited that now they, they can see that they're able to achieve this step in their career. And now this is, I know that it's just the beginning. So that's what I really enjoy the most. Wow. So a real transformation in your clients. Yes. Wow. Awesome. Well, very cool. So, uh, when you were back, I'm going to take you back to junior high, high school, when you were a young person, is this what you wanted to be when you grew up? Do you think you were going to be a career coach? No, I didn't even know career coaches existed. <laughs> I didn't even know that was a thing, to be honest. In high school, I wanted to be an architect. So I, you know, one of the many classes that I took was architecture. And I actually won um, a few awards and I have interned with Frank Lloyd Wright's grandson in Wisconsin. Um, through a competition I entered um, in architecture. So that was my route. I already had internships in high school um, for different architecture, project management, and construction firms. And that was going to be my path. And of course, I went to college. And like I said, I mostly, I would say 75% of the time I'm an extrovert. And I realized being an architect, it's more of an introvert job where you're kind of cornered and you have to do designs and you don't actually do like the client aspect of it. It's more of you know, there's a head architect that's been doing this for quite some time and, you know, 15, 25 years into the industry, then they have to be client facing. And then, you know, starting out or in the, next, the first few years, you're kind of just in the back end saying, hey, can you make sure these measurements are correct? And we're trying to visualize this. Can you combine these two, three different designs? And I absolutely hated it. I'm like, <laughs> how did I not know about this earlier? I cannot be stuck in like a cubicle making drawings all day and not be interacting with people. Um, so that's when I ended up, you know, changing my major, even in high school, um, college, where I went to economics and sociology, studying, you know, people and opportunity costs and, you know, how the economy works. So that I really enjoy that. And I think that um, even to even uh, major in that, I then switched to healthcare, um, where I got my master's in public health policy and administration. Wow. Wow. Well, it's so great that you had that aha moment in college because you could have spent a lot of money and a lot of time getting a degree in architecture and then then got into the industry and went, oh, this isn't for me. And then, you know, had to go back. So to shift it midstream like that was probably a real big aha. And then it opened other doors. It sounds like if you went down that path and then you got your master's even in something else. So, OK, well, so what was your first job then at a high, at a college? Um, I had, so my first job was working at Fermilab Accelerator Laboratory. So it was more like an internship and job. And it was a really interesting job because it, you know, I took classes in the morning. So like soldering, um, how to build rocket ships and like some really cool, interesting things. And then afterwards I will go into like Fermilab where they did a lot of um, speaking engagements around, you know, science. And I'm not like a scientist. I, I don't even know exactly where some of, what they were even talking about, but I was in charge of like the editing and doing all these website stuff. And honestly, if you asked me to do this right now, I wouldn't even know where to start. I have no idea how I even learned that, you know, at the age of like 16 years old, but that was my first job. So it was a really good experience. It was interesting because it was far away and my mom worked. So I think I had to be up around six in the morning because the bus was going to pick me up at seven. And then I didn't get into the location until like almost nine, nine thirty in the morning. Oh, so, and wow. then from then on, yeah, I came back. And then eventually on weekends, I started working at Carson Peary Scott, which is like a department clothing store. Um, so I worked there um, like as a cashier and then obviously taking care of some of the customers that go into the store as well. Oh, okay. So you had, you started work at a very early age and even had a weird long commute at an <laughs> early age. Jeez, that's, uh, 
that's the yeah. achiever in you, which is probably another <laughs> reason why your, your health crashed a bit, right? <laughs> yes. See, like, like, like I said, I was just like, yes, I'll, I was a yes person. I'll say yes to everything, any organization, any um, internship, any job. I'm like, yes, I want to, I want to gain the experience. And I think it's because I felt like I had to make up for the fact that I couldn't do sports. You know, everyone says like, well, join sports. You learn, you know, how to be a great teamwork, like, you know, person and all this collaboration. And I was like, well, I can't, I physically can't do it. And I even try to sneak into like some of these sports. And of course they ask you for your physical and then, then I couldn't provide it and okay. they disappeared. Yeah. You got busted, so, busted straight exactly. out of the gate. Couldn't even start. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so what about out of college then? Um, how, how did your career then get started? And when did the master's come in or did you go into your master's uh, program right out of uh, your undergrad? So I have a full ride scholarship from Bill and Melinda Gates. So they pay for my bachelor's and my master's. The caveat is I could only take one year off between bachelor's and master's. So I graduated with my bachelor's degree and you know, again, I have been very involved. I did a lot of activities. I did internships. I did really well in school. I, I just checked off everything. So I'm like, all right, this is a time where I'm just going to get flooded in with a whole bunch of interviews and I can handpick whatever offer that I want. And I had one interview <laughs> and thankfully they offered me the job, but that's when I just, I, I just felt devastated. I'm like, what did I do wrong? I, I did everything everyone told me to do. And yet I can't even I can't, it's hard for me to get any interviews. No one will even consider me or look at me. How do I, I actually have experience because I did internships and yet that's not good enough for them. So I really felt frustrated. I felt vulnerable. I felt lost. I'm the first person in my family to, you know, go to college. So it's not like I had, you know, my parents could connect me with somebody, one of their friends. My mom was a hair beautician. So I, I knew that I needed to do this kind of like figure it out on my own. And I didn't have anyone that I can, I felt like I can reach out to. So I took the job and then, you know, I, I promised myself that I was going to figure it out. Clearly, I don't know how to deal with this aspect of getting ahead in your career and getting jobs. I'm good at doing really good at schoolwork, but I can't do this aspect of it. So I need to figure out. And that's how um, it happened with my first job right out of college. And, you know, since then it did take me around three to four years to figure it out. But now, I mean, I can, if I wanted to, I know I can easily get a job within any industry and I don't have to take a pay cut and I don't need to start from scratch, even if it's in an industry I've never done before. And um, so that's when, what prompted me. I did a year as a financial service, uh, licensed financial representative. So selling health insurance, stocks and bonds and managing 401ks. And after a year, I knew I needed to go back for my master's because that's as long as the break that will give me within the scholarship. Otherwise I lose the scholarship overall. So I told my employer, you know, I'm going back to school. Like I mentioned during, you know, our conversations. So I'll be starting in the fall. And one of the degrees they pay for is public health policy and administration. And at that time, I think I was working around 70, 80 hours um, or so. And of course they said, well, no, you either you work your, your hours or you leave like, there's no negotiation here. And that's when I decided to leave them and go full-time to school. And then I grabbed like a part-time job and that's how, like how that pivoted into, that's how I got into that specific degree. Um, and that's just how it happened overall. I didn't know what I was doing. I just knew that I needed to get my master's degree. And if my employer wasn't going to be respectful of that, then I was just going to replace them. Mm, yeah. Yeah, because I mean, you'd only really invested a year in um, in that in that employment, but you'd already invested, you know, you're invested in the scholarship, right? And so that yeah. was that was the bigger loyalty yeah. play there. Wow. And I was straightforward from the beginning, just letting them know. By the way, you know, I just graduated, and in a year, I do have to go back to school. Otherwise, I lose my full ride scholarship, where they pay for my rent, books, personal expenses. They, I mean, they paid for everything and. I mean, how can I say no to like almost a hundred thousand dollars for me to get my master's? And they knew that from the beginning, they still hired me. And then for them to tell me no, um, was very heartbreaking again. And I'm like, how, what else could I have done to change the situation? But, um, that's when I still, I had to make a choice and my choice was to choose me and get my master's degree. 
Yeah. Yeah. Well, and you also knew, you know, that long-term investment in you was going to pay off versus if I were, if you work another year to two years in that job, was it going to have the same payoff as the master's and the long-term run on that? So, yeah. Yeah. And honestly, I, I, I didn't like my job as a licensed <laughs> financial rep, but I can see like the pain point that some of my clients tell me where they say, I hate my job. I don't know what to do next. I'm just going to go and get a master's degree. And then, then I'll have like all these management director jobs coming towards me. And it, it, it unfortunately doesn't happen that way, but I can totally understand that because I did it in my version of my career trajectory where I did have a timeline, but when it came to it, I decided I wanted to go back to school because I didn't know what I wanted to do next. I just didn't, I just knew I just didn't want to be a licensed financial rep. <laughs> yeah, 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 that is funny. A lot of times we learn what we don't want and yeah. that's way more clear than it is what we do want. And that takes a little bit longer, so. All right. So you finish your master's and now you have this uh, public policy. Say again what your master's was in. <laughs> master's in public policy and administration, public health policy and administration. Administration. OK, so now you're thinking, OK, well, what jobs are available at this point? Right. Yeah. So when I was working as a grad student um, at the university, they actually offered me a full time job. They wanted me to handle their business operations and. I took on the job full time while still attending, you know, my master's degree. And that's when I, I start, I, you know, I try to negotiate like, Hey, this is something I'm really interested. I love the business management aspect of it. I increased revenue. I decreased ta um, liabilities and, you know, expenses. I've gotten over 80 new partners for the, or the department in itself. And it's really expanding our reach. And they're like, you know what? I, I, we can't, we just can't, we can't afford to pay you that much. And like I said, I, I, I totally understand it. And I'm not always going to say like every company should be able to, like they, they might be able to, sometimes they can't, or sometimes your boss isn't the person that's going to promote you or give you that salary increase. But that's when I decided to say, if they can't pay me this much, then I am going to look elsewhere and then find something aligned with my degree that I just graduated in and then be able to hit that salary benchmark that I'm looking you know, to achieve. And I was able to do so. So I went from education and then I went to hospital setting. It's actually within the same university that I went and got my, my master's in. So same, if, you know, in quotes, same company, just different departments, university side and then the hospital side. And through there, I was able to get a $30,000 salary increase. They actually wanted someone with a nursing degree and clinical background. I had none of it. Um, you know, I had this public health policy um, degree, but it's not like it was anything clinical. It, we, I would never have to learn anything clinical. And that's when, you know, I branded myself in a way that, you know, felt aligned with what they were trying to achieve with this role. You say that you want a clinical background degree. I understand. But based on the conversations we had, it sounds like you're looking to improve the patient experience. I can give you the patient perspective because I don't have a clinical background. I don't have a nursing degree and neither do your patients. So I can help you give voice to those patients that if I can't understand it, our, clearly our patients can't. And got the job offer with like a $30,000 salary increase. And they knew how much I was making because I was still part of the organization. Um, so that's how it started. And then I wanted to go on the private side of the business. And of course, I was also now engaged and you know about to get married and buy a house. So I, I wanted another $30,000 salary increase. So I started my job search and got another $30,000 um, salary increase within the private sector at a really great company with a great position, which was client facing. Um, and that's kind of my progression has been on. It's I always search to learn and gain really good experience, but not having to sacrifice salary. I feel like you can do both. It's, you know, um, it's just all about where you look and how you brand yourself and as long as you know how to do it, you're able to do this successfully where I've had, I've, like I said, I've learned so much. I was even handpicked by the CEO for special projects because of the results I was bringing within my um, role in itself. Even though I had been there for maybe six, 12 months, I was already seeing results where a lot of my elder counterparts have been doing this now for you know, 10, 15 years and weren't getting the results that I was getting to at that point. But it's not because I'm super smart. I'm not. It's more of, I just reached out to other people that were in the same role that I was in, maybe five years more experience. And I asked them, you know, what are some of your best practices? What are some of the achievements? What are some of the results and how did you do it? 
And then I just grabbed what they told me and tried to implement it within my organization. And I was able to get the similar results to them. And that's how I accelerate and really try to accelerate my learning as well within any role. Oh, so it's not like you walk in with all the answers. No, you, God, no. Like I said, I even have a clinical background. Or <laughs> I think I probably qualify 30% of based on what they put in the job posting. Wow. Yeah. So how did you come up with that? I'm just so curious that, well, I don't have, you want, you know, that whole patient experience. Well, our patients don't have a nursing background. I mean, how did you come up with that? I mean, that's brilliant. Or did it just come to you to, and you're like, oh. No, it's preparation. And I tell my clients, let's prepare for the expected and the unexpected. I had networked before that interview. I already had networked with people within the hospital, people that would I would have to work with had I had that role. And I did. And I asked them, you know, working with person and I was a quality assurance manager. So what do you like? How do you work with a quality assurance manager? What is the main objective? What are some of like the things that are most frustrating to you? What will make your job easier that this person can help you? Asking all those questions across various different stakeholders gave me the answers that I needed. And I like to say, it's almost like asking to the answers to the test. Just at, what is the hardest skill to hire for? What do you wish would happen differently? What does the process look like? And I kept hearing over and over again, well, the goal is to improve patient experience because it's all tied to how much the hospital gets paid out. And then of course, branding. So I knew that was the most important thing. That's the reason why they made this role. Okay, well, what are some of the struggles and challenges? So that's why I already anticipated that that was going to be their objection. I saw the job posting. They said preferred nursing degree or PhD in like nursing with clinical experience. So I already knew the objections beforehand because I networked. I did my research. So when the time came to it, I already had a response ready for them. I knew this was the elephant in the room and I needed to address it in order for me to be, come across and pass that obstacle. So I already had planned my um, response that when they asked for it, they were like, we totally agree. And I'm like, you know, here's what I would do differently or here's what I would you know, plan to do in the next 30, 60, 90 days if I was in this role. And these are similar strategies. And I looked at already other hospitals that were similar to um, this institution that were in similar situations and they were able to make these improvements by doing A, B, and C. I noticed already, and I talked to some of your um, um, employees and within the department in itself that you don't have these processes in place. And that's what I would start. Of course, understanding more of what the process workflow is and what are some of the low hanging fruit. Never done that job before. I don't, like I said, I tell my clients, you don't need to be the expert because if you can do everything in the job posting, then you are not growing. You should not be able to check off every single requirement they have in that job posting. You should have some areas where you tell yourself, I don't know how to do this, but I'm glad and I'm excited to apply for this role so I can learn. Mm, wow. Very, very confident, very confident <laughs> approach, but so confident because you've done your homework, you've planned, exactly. you've prepared, you've really looked at it. And, um, I think the other thing I'm, I'm getting out of what your experience, uh, what you just shared with me, it's this, um, how do you bring it back to the interview, what they're really looking for? Because you're right. We, I think so many times uh, employers get caught up in that. Um, oh, we need uh, this type of degree. We need this many years of experience. We need this, we need this. And what you're saying is no, turn it really on. Well, what's the goal? What are you trying to achieve? And how can I bring, how can I focus on how I can get you there? Not necessarily all the other things that you think are the things that get you there. Uh, I get it. Okay, yeah. cool. So I reached out to like people that would be my manager. So I don't, I don't reach out to the person that's going to be interviewing me. By that time, it's usually too late, but I already know I'm going to be applying to these types of roles. So I'm going to interview and reach out, interview, but like for informational interviews, and I'm going to reach out to people who potentially may be a manager or within that role. So if I'm a quality insurance manager, Maybe I'll be reporting to someone that's a director of quality assurance. And I reach out to them on LinkedIn blindly. I don't know them. I cold email them and I create a very personalized email asking them if I can get on a quick call with them. And I ask them, what is the hardest skill to hire for, for a quality assurance manager? You know, can you tell me a little bit more of what are some of those challenges that are not known besides A, B, and C? What are some other things that you wish, you know, this person would do? Can you tell me about your highest performing um, employee in your team and why are they the best? What makes them the best? So getting all these answers, then I know what to lead with during the interview process. Oh, I, you know, I'm going to, whatever the hardest skill to hire for, that's going to be my top skill that I highlight, whether on the about me section or my greatest strength 
of course, what um, it being my greatest strength, I'm not going to lie either. Yeah. If so, it's not, if you're, yeah. 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 And then that's when, uh, that's when I leave with, and that's how I've been able to get salary increases. And my clients have even received up to a hundred thousand dollar salary increases, sometimes for a lateral job, just because we were able to almost uncover and expose that, um, gap in the, in the interviewing process that we already know that we know other, other competitions can't, um, either highlight or bring it up to the conversation. And then lastly is, addressing and taking control of the interview. I have my clients always ask during the interview process, Kathy, based on everything we've discussed, do you, do I have your support in moving forward to next steps? Oh, wow. If I don't, if you're like, well, Claude, I think you're great. Uh, I think you have all the qualifications. You'll be hearing from us and you'll be interviewing with my boss and blah, blah, blah. Now you can leave that interview at peace knowing you're moving to next steps. You're not have to wonder, you don't have to be nervous and, you know, have all this self-doubt, you can walk confidently from that interview. But if they say, you know what, I, I think you're good, but we're really looking for someone with that clinical experience. And it's really important, especially if we were working with doctors. You know, I totally understand it, Kathy, um, you know, based on what we discussed, really the objective of what the role especially is around and how success is being measured is by doing A, B, and C. And, you know, by doing so, I can focus on that. At the end of the day, I will be that liaison for those patients. I don't have clinical experience, but I also know what, what is the so what for all our patients? You know, how can you help me? How can you reduce anxiety in a very environment where we feel like we don't have control? But again, it's all through preparation. And that, that, that's how you uncover any challenges or obstacles that are really going to be preventing you from moving to next steps or getting that job offer. Yeah, yeah, I get it. Totally, totally get it. Uh, of course, you make it sound so easy. I can tell you, sitting there in the room when you've been sweating bullets for how long to get in it. <laughs> but I, I do practice <laughs> that whole that whole piece about um, you know asking them at the end is so important because then you know when you're leaving, you know you can uh, you can can re, you know do the rebuttal if if you need to, or you know you're going to be moving on. But at least you know, right? Versus well, so many times we walk out and we don't know. We have no idea. Yeah. Just hoping hoping it's going to, so, and, so this is kind of how you, you managed your career moves. Um, so were there some other career moves in there that you want to get to, or was it, when did you decide, okay, this is, I, this is a strength. I need to teach others this. I mean, that's, that's kind of the next big leap, right? Yeah. So while I was, you know, finally, when I realized, Hey, I know how to transition different industries. I know how to get salary increases and I could do it in a way that's, it's not confrontation or anything. No, and it's not manipulative yeah. at all. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's straight up. <laughs> straight exactly. up to the work. <laughs> so I've had clients, um, well, at the time, my friends and everyone reaching out, well, how did you do this? And I actually got featured in Business Insider and it had like over a million views in less than a week. Well, how, how did you do this? And I, like, how did you, can you teach me? I have my year in reviews coming up and I started helping them. And so while I was working throughout this whole time, that's when I started my career coaching business. I started helping others. I, first, I just started with friends. I wasn't charging them. And when I started seeing results that I worked across various industries or levels of experience, then that's when I started my business, started helping others. And I'll admit, like around last year in 2020, I was at a crossroads. I love anything business, sales. Like, I mean, I started my business at 25. Um, I had a virtual admin business back then. And I started it because I wanted to be a business owner. I wanted to learn sales and I love numbers and money and everything. I'm not, I, I'm, I don't feel ashamed to say I love money. That's why I make sure that I try to do my best and I deliver the best in order to be able to charge, you know, the, the value that it's bringing. So I, that's why I started a business and I, you know, my husband's in sales. So I've kind of always had this interest in sales and marketing. I, I really enjoy it. And I was like, well, I'm either going to go into like the sales marketing aspect or I'm going to go full time on my job. I still, I mean, on my, on my business, I'm still not sure because I really enjoy both. And at my company, I got offered a, another position from another department. And it was originally, they said they can only give me an 8% salary increase. And I think it equated to something like, I don't know, maybe like 14, $15,000 more if that. And I was like, no, I am not taking, I think it was around $11,000. And I was like, no, I, I looked at the market rate and it looks like for somebody in this position for me to be director of this role, my salary requirements between 120 to 130. Is there any way we can close that gap? 
And they're like, well, we can see what we can do. You know, we can only give you 8% salary increase. I'm like, I totally understand. But, you know, this is like, based on what we discussed, you're looking for someone that could do A, B, and C. And you're looking for someone internal because of all the, somebody that's familiar with the systems and everything. And, you know, based on all these roles and responsibilities, this is a salary that I'm looking for. And within 24 hours, like we were able to work it out. We can offer you this much. And, you know, at that point, they're like, well, we also need you to do all these other things. And that's when, you know, my husband and I, we talked about it. And he's actually the one that encouraged me to say, you know what? Why don't you go full time on your business? You can do the sales and the marketing within your business itself. Let like I support you. We're ready. And if this is something you do it, this is the best time to do it. Um, so why don't why don't you go ahead and take that leap? And he really gave me that push. And that's when I respectfully declined the offer. And then I went full time on my business. And now it's been a little bit over a year. Now it's been very successful. And I'm, you know, like I said, I'm very excited and happy that I've been able to help so many uh, people out there with helping them accelerate their job search, get jobs that they felt like they kept, they couldn't achieve, or they just kept getting passed over or salaries that they only dreamed about, but never felt like they can actually achieve. And that's been really um, meaningful to me where I feel like, especially when I'm helping women, because my mission and my, what I feel is when you empower women, you empower the household. And you start creating safe homes. And by providing women opportunities, they can alleviate or not be in dangerous situations where they don't have to because of monetary reasons. Yeah, there's choices. There's so many more choices. And there's there's power with the fact that you're, you know, financially, um, you know, financially independent yourself. Uh, and then you're bringing and contributing to the family. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of confidence that goes with that. So. Mm -hmm. Wow. So for so many reasons, right? It's an underlying purpose that, uh, that you're uh, achieving here. So, well, Claudia, I got to tell you, I could keep chatting all afternoon. Your, your energy is contagious, by the way. And, <laughs> um, and I just, I just love how you think and how do you pull this apart? I got to tell you that that hasn't been my mindset. I had a, I, I would say a pretty successful career in corporate, but I think I got caught up in that. Oh, I got promoted. Here's Here's the percent increase. And, you know, many times what happens on the internal candidate is all of a sudden, five years in, you're way lower than a lot of the external candidates uh, because you just haven't, you know, pushed and negotiated. And, you know, I got used to the, the you know, the, uh, the line that said, oh, well, you know, typical promotion is eight to 10 percent. Maybe we could go 15 and then this and that. And then, yeah. So yeah, I just, I needed, I needed to know you, dang it. I'm, I'm mad that I, I'm this old and now I finally get to know you, so. <laughs> well, we can help now your listeners. Um, yeah, and one, of, things, point. Yeah. one can, of the things that I tell everyone is stop basing your next salary or your next job based on your current salary. It literally has nothing to, nothing to do with each other. So the way that I, like most people will say, well, I'm currently making 50, so for my next promotion, maybe I can ask for 58, or maybe I just hate my company and then I just want to make a ladder move. As long as I stay within the same pay, I'm happy. But how I like to think about it is, well, no, when you started this job, you got paid 50. It's been three years in that role. Those three years of experience, you need to start charging for that. And you should be charging what the market is paying for that. So the analogy I love to use is house. Let's just say you bought a house, Kathy, for 100,000. And I'm ready to pay 300,000 for that house of yours. Are you really going to tell me, no, Claudia, I cannot take your 300,000 because I paid a hundred thousand. I'll sell it to you for 120. I'll sell it to you for $120,000 because it's only fair. Cause that's what I purchased it. <laughs> if you told me that I would say, Kathy, what, what is happening here? Why are you not taking my $300,000? Why don't you taking my money? So the same thing with salary, don't charge where you're currently making charge, whatever the market is paying. And there's different ways and strategies to figure out, you know, what is that salary that you can be asking for, but stop using that as your compass to figure out your next income, because it literally can be nothing related to each other. Yeah, absolutely. Well, in fact, there's, um, I was just on this call this morning with, it, it was a, um, uh, a friend of mine who is an HR professional, and she was doing a webinar on different laws and such for 2020. And there's several states that are now banning uh, that asking that requirement about, well, what were you, you know, your, your salary history for that very reason. And part of it is for women and pay equity and, and all of that such. Um, so for that very same reason, which is, well, what does the, what, wait a minute. It's like, what is the position, the range of the position, not what was I making before? 
exactly. Or even like yeah. when um, I responded crazy because let's just say you're an intern and you're making like, I mean, now let's just say 15 an hour, you're making minimum wage. Well, if they ask you, well, what are you previously making? Well, I was an intern working part-time making 15 an hour. Why does that matter? I'm applying for an analyst job where you're going to have me full time. And I've interned and have this like expertise, even though like, and I just graduated college. Why does me, and I also worked at McDonald's making 15 an hour. Like, does that really matter in order for you to determine how much you're going to pay me? No. And I love that some of these states have um, made it against the law to ask for those questions because it has nothing to do with each other. Unless yeah. we, unless we can ask the employees or the employers to say, well, how much, what is the salary rate you pay for this role? How much have you paid your, what do you pay your highest paid employee? Because we, you know, typically it's seen frowned upon on. So why is it okay for them to ask us that? It's none yeah. of their business. I'll tell you what I'm willing to charge for my expertise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then flipping it on his head, flipping it on his head. All right. Well, Claudia, we, we do need to start wrapping up. So uh, I have two wrap up questions that I always love to hear. And I'm, I can't wait to hear your answers on these. And that is, um, first question is, when you look back on your career now and what you're doing today, uh, what do you think served you best as you, you know, it could be a personality trait, a strength, uh, a discipline, but what do you think has served you best to get to where you are? Um, I definitely agree with like success fear, um, success favors the bold. I've been bold a lot of times. Like I said, I reached out to people on LinkedIn that I didn't know got rejected really badly in the beginning because I didn't know what to say and how to personalize those, um, you know, connection invites. But I, I mean, I, I, have like, there's so many things I've done for the first time that I've really failed and I've been the worst, but I learned from that and said, okay, well, clearly this is not the way to do it. Let me figure it out. And honestly, with Google and internet search and YouTube, everything can be learned. Like I can learn anything I know from, you know, for a lot of things like copywriting and everything that's needed, I can learn from the internet by itself, by myself type of thing. Mm -hmm. But so I do agree with success uh, favors the bold. And I feel like that's why I've got a lot of career success, but also in business success and been featured in Business Insider and Forbes and all these other accolades because I didn't expect per perfection. I knew I was going to fail and I still did it. And at times, you know, they'll tell me, Claudia, I you know, that, that was probably, uh, it kind of threw me off the email you sent me, but you know, I, I still commend you for reaching out to me. And, you know, I think eventually you have a great story. Let's talk. But again, if I had not sent that email, I wouldn't even have that opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, I think I'm going to bump you on the risk meter then, you know, you said you were a five. I think we got to put you more in the, um, maybe the 11 or 12 on a scale. Okay. Of five. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Success favors the bold. Okay. Well, uh, that leads then into the next question, which is uh, any words of wisdom that impacted you at a point in your career? And, or maybe it's words of wisdom that you share with others or that um, just had been meaningful for you. So my, my motto that I feel like has been my navigation is I love the, the quote that says, do what others won't to achieve what others can't. So, and I find this to be true in a lot of areas in my life, business and career. And that's where the foundation comes around the strategies that I show my clients. And if you look at what, if, you know, what I, even in job search, most people do the same thing. I, they say the same thing and they do the same thing. If they haven't interviewed, they maybe, you know, try to prep two to three days before the interview itself. They'll look at the company website. They'll look at the job posting. Maybe they'll look at the person on LinkedIn. Maybe they'll Google some questions on like how to answer. Tell me about yourself. And that's really it. Like that's where the work ends. And they say, well, yeah, I prepped for this interview. I don't know why I didn't get it. Well, because you did it what everyone else is doing. You got to do what others are not doing. And if you don't know what most people are doing, just ask your friends or uh, acquaintances and just ask them, how do, can you like, I'm curious to know, like, what, how do you prepare for a job interview? And you'll hear the same thing over and over again. What is your biggest weakness? Oh, I work too hard. I'm a perfectionist. <laughs> That's not a real weakness. And everyone hears it day in and day out. So instead, look at what everyone else is doing and saying, and then just ask yourself, how can I make it better? At least 10 or 20% better than everyone else. And that's going to take you very far. That's how I've been able to get success. Even with you know my clients, what are other career coaches saying? They'll say, follow your passion. 
you know, um, money isn't everything. It's not, but I'm not, I'm still going to put that on the table. We are going to have this discussion. I want to teach you how to negotiate your salary because why not? It's still part of the process. And I don't like the fluffy advice of like, just, just listen to your gut or follow your passion. All these other, you know, very surface level things. Instead, I would say, let's use positive elimination. If you don't know what to do, here's how we start. Then you're going to do A, B, and C. Let me walk you through this whole entire process. And then this is how you determine and filter out and funnel what you really want to do. And we test it out. Here's what that looks like. I like actionable concrete steps that anyone can apply because that's how I learn. And again, it's just adding that 10, 20% more than what everyone else is doing. Yeah. Yeah. I get that. Totally. You're, yeah. Spot on. You're right. I, I looking back and now I'm feeling a little guilty. I'm like, Oh, well, that was me. <laughs> seems so like, well, I. I should just stand out. I should just stand out, but I don't. Right. Cause I'm no, like anything else. Right. It, everything is learned. Like I didn't, I wasn't born <laughs> knowing all these things. I, and I bet you in a year from now, I'm going to have a different, like, Oh, why didn't I think about doing this? Mm -hmm. And it just goes time. But I really, I have a growth mindset where I know that I will never know everything. I know that. And I'm okay with that. And I'm happy with that. But how can I do what I'm doing better? And it's not just, I read everything careers. I apply a lot of business um, philosophies and strategies in careers. I just, you know, change it for this landscape, but I use a lot of other uh, strategies from other fields because I continue expanding my, and learning. And I, I invest in myself very heavily, even where, um, you know, sometimes I cringe like, oh my God, I can't believe I'm about to spend this much. But I know that I have yet to fail, even though I have failed. But at the end of the day, I still, my failures have been really great insights for me and I will continue to do so. And again, most people won't do that. People stop investing in themselves after they finish college. They never read a book. They don't listen to podcasts. So they stop their learning right there. And even to your listeners now, like, they're listening to this podcast. So all of a sudden, like you do have that learning and growth mindset. You're already doing more than what other people are not doing. And it's going to help you stay ahead in your career. And just think about it. What else can I be doing? And that's really going to take you far because again, most people don't do those things. So yeah, I, I hope your listeners found this very helpful. And of course, if they implemented any of these strategies or want to reach out to me with any questions, um, they can reach out to me anytime. I'm always happy to hear uh, other people's stories. Yeah. Wow. Well, great. So the yeah, idea, yeah. so how would someone work with you? Typically they would just uh, reach out to you and then you just see if it's a fit, right? You kind of, there's that first free, I'm, I'm assuming it's a free consultation of some sort about, right. is this really a fit for us to work together and what are they yeah. looking for? What do you bring? That kind of a thing. Okay. Yeah. So they can go to my website, claudiatmiller.com. So T as in Tom. And they can schedule a free career strategy call with me for 30 minutes. And that's when I'll assess, you know, can I help them? And can, um, and are they coachable? You know, if you're, mm. if a person's like, well, I don't have a job because of the economy and everything that's happening, I can't help you because I can't, I have no control over the economy or anything. But if you tell me, hey, I haven't got a job because I don't know how to sell myself and I don't know what to do or how to do it, I can help you. I have the strategies. So it's really, and making sure that, you know, they like me. I mean, like my, I'm very um, transparent. I'm very forward. Um, I still try to be understanding and empathetic, but maybe some people just like it very cutthroat and like boot camp style. And that's not me. So um, that 30 minute call is really for us to get to know each other and see if I'm able to help them. And if not, then I can try to point them out to other resources that might be able to help them. Yeah. Great. Awesome. Well, Claudia, thank you so much for sharing your story, but also for sharing so much of your expertise. I mean, that was, is really helpful because I mean, this is, you know, a podcast for people just starting out or in transition and stuck and they need all of those things. Sometimes we need a little, um, a little shot of boldness, right? And, and if you can't muster it yourself, someone else can muster it in you, you know, and, and it's like, well, wait a minute, I do, I have accomplished all these things. I do bring this value, even though I feel like I haven't gotten any interviews in three months. Um, you know, so, you, you know, your confidence does wane when you don't get any feedback or you don't get any, um, any I, uh, you know, response and, and reinforcement yeah. that, you know, you're on. But like you point. said, Kathy, that's feedback. If you apply, so like my, I tell clients, well, how many jobs have you applied to? A hundred. Oh, you only had two interviews? It's not your interviews. You need to work on your resume. Clearly there's something happening that you're not getting interviews. But if you're applying to 10 jobs, getting three to four interviews, 
but you never get the job offer, you need help with your interviewing skills. Your resume is fine. It's your interviewing skills that need help. So even that data itself is data. And it's, it tells you exactly, don't do what other people won't. Don't apply to more jobs and then ex expect the same results. That's what is it, the definition of insanity. So mm -hmm. instead say, well, I applied this many jobs, got zero interviews, clearly it's my resume. Or I need to hire a professional so they can tell me what I can, what I'm doing wrong or how to do it right. Yeah. Um, I'm at my point of, I'd rather hire someone and then, then have to figure it out myself and spend the next few years <laughs> trying to get the same result Yeah, that somebody can get in like a day or in a few days. Yeah. And then, and then you're in that mode of, well, I'm guessing, am I guessing on what the real issue is versus if you hire a professional and they might know right away, like you said. So, mm -hmm. well, Claudia, thank you so much again. And, um, you know, listeners, if you enjoyed today's interview, please subscribe below and then you'll be alerted as other interviews are published. And then if you want to reach out to Claudia, she gave you her website. Say it again, if you would, Claudia. Claudia T. Miller.com. So C-L-A-U-D-I-A-T-M-I-L-L-E-R.com. Awesome. And then I'll also post her social media, that website and any other social media she'd like me to include on my website, lifestorycurator.com. And so if you have any questions for me or for Claudia, or, you know, you can reach out either to me or to her, but, um, you know, this has just been fantastic. And uh, I know I'm, I'm more encouraged. And now I look at some of my friends and family, if they're stuck, I'm going to be going, oh, you need to call Claudia. <laughs> <laughs> All righty. Well, thank you again for sharing your story and your expertise. And uh, listeners, I guess on that note, I'll just say stay safe, stay well, and let's keep sharing those stories. Have a great day.